My name is Eric Huber and I'm a vice president here at NW3C where I lead the high tech crime section. Before I came to NW3C, I worked for a very large bank where I did quite a few BEC investigations. The best definition I can come up with with business email compromise is when a fraudster uses social engineering emails to get you to send them your money or your data. Most definitions revolve around the transfer of funds via wire, and that's a popular scenario, but fraudsters are happy to get money through wire, ACH, any method they can. They're also very happy to get a hold of your data, such as sensitive W-2 data that they can turn around and monetize. There are two main methods to do business email compromise. The first one is the oldest method, and that's when fraudsters would research an organization, generally a small and medium-sized business, figure out their email address, their email domains, and then they would use their own email to pretend to be someone such as a chief executive officer, and then they would send email to someone like a chief financial officer and try and trick them to send money. That worked out pretty well. Then what they figured out, it was even more efficient to target an organization, send email into that organization, a phishing email that held a malicious link on it. You click on the link, the machines are infected, then they would start monitoring email and they could start reading email to figure out how money moved, who was authorized to move money, and then they would actually take control of the email and send the emails to trick a chief financial officer or a controller or somebody else who was in charge of moving money to get them to move the money. So in responding to a BEC, containment is the name of the game for the initial steps. Go talk to the victim's bank, figure out where the funds have flowed, and then talk to the institutions where the money has ended up and get those accounts frozen. If you have a business email compromise that involves an international wire, you have a tool available to you called the FBI's Financial Fraud Kill Chain that can result in the wire being sent back if it's successful. The rules of engagement are it has to be an international wire, over $50,000, has to have been sent within 72 hours, and the bank that sent it needs to send out a swift recall notice. The way I recommend you engage the financial fraud kill chain is have your victim make a report at ic3.gov and then have you reach out to an FBI field office to request that they engage the kill chain. Okay, now that the money has been frozen, now you move into recovery. The problem with business email compromise is this is a case where the fraudster is directing the victim to send the money. Because of that, the victim is in the loss position. The bank isn't going to make the victim whole. That gives you two main ways to get the money back. The first is through the indemnification process. The indemnification is very simply the victim's bank reaching out to the bank that has the funds and basically saying they will cover them if there's any sort of litigation costs because they return the money back to the victim's bank. The problem is in many cases, the victim's bank won't do the indemnification. In that case, you have another option, which is debit authority. Debit authority is very simply the bank that has the funds going to the beneficiary, the person who owns the account, and asking him to send the money back. If the person who received the funds is a romance scam victim or a money mule, they may do the right thing and send the money back. But if it's a fraudster, they may not be talking to the bank or anyone, and they may have disappeared. In that case, your best way to get the money back is using your local seizure warrant process. That's going to a court and just getting a court order that directs the bank that has the victim's funds to send it back to the victim. One of the investigative tools that you have available to you are suspicious activity reports. These are reports that banks have to file when they have a suspect and over $5,000 of suspicious activity. Even if they don't have a suspect, and they have $25,000 of suspicious activity, they have to file a SAR. If they have a suspect, that SAR has to be filed in 30 days. If they don't have a suspect, that SAR has to be filed in 60 days. You can get that SAR from your local federal law enforcement partners, or each state generally has a FinCEN coordinator, generally housed in a state investigative agency that has access to those SARs. What the SARS will give you is any information they have on a suspect, identifying information, dates of birth, aliases, any information they have on that person. And it's basically an investigative report from the bank on the incident. This is extremely valuable in your investigation and you should pull the SARS along with subpoenaing any documents from the bank. If you have a BEC investigation and you need technical assistance, that's one of the things we do here at NW3C. Please reach out to us and we'll be happy to assist.